welcome you to our fifth session here at Digiversity. We are going to start by reviewing the six clues to observation. We talked about looking at what is emphasized. We also talked about looking at what is repeated. We discussed what is related, things that are alike, and things that are unlike, and we discuss the things that are true to life. These six clues or these six observation questions will aid you in becoming a better biblical detective. And as we move forward and we talk more about these six principles, we have to evaluate how the section as a whole relates to the rest of the book using the six principles. That means, my brothers and my sisters, that we're going to have to engage in reading. We're going to have to be diligent in our process, and we're going to have to be committed to reading the word on a regular basis. Also, when we look at a section, try to state the main point of that section. See if you can boil it down to one word or a short phrase that summarizes the content. In a journal or in your Bible, keep a list of your observations. Study the persons and the places mentioned in the text. See what you can learn about them. See what you can learn about where they're from. And see how it ties into the section as a whole. Keep a list of your unanswered questions and unresolved problems. These can become an avenue for further investigation. Lastly, ask yourself, what have I seen in this section that challenges the way that I live? What principles or what issues does this passage address? What change do I need to consider in my life in light of what I have read? And what is the application for my life? Value of interpretation. A teacher is a person with a primary task of instructing other people. In the church, the teacher's primary task is to read the Bible, to know the Bible to be obedient to the Bible and be equipped to explain the Bible. It is our job to explain what the biblical text means. Explaining the Bible is what we were called to do. It is impossible to explain God's word until we understand God's word. And the better we can explain God's word, the better that we can apply God's word to our own lives. Acting on what God has said assumes you understand what he has said. That's why the second major step in firsthand Bible study is the step of interpretation. And let me throw this in. Many times we want to begin Bible study with interpretation, but observation must precede our interpretation. Here, with interpretation, we ask the question, what does it mean? In order to answer the question, what does it mean? we have to make sure we are understanding what we are reading. When we begin, we must ask ourselves, and we cannot be afraid to ask other people, do you understand what you are reading? And then we ask ourselves, what do we mean by interpretation? Every book of scripture has a message and the message can be understood. Second Timothy 3.16 states, all scripture 
is profitable. How do we come to the understanding that all scripture is profitable? When you have time, I would like for you to read one Psalm 119 in its entirety. But for the sake of time on today, we are going to read Psalm 119, 34. And it simply reads, give me understanding and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all my heart. As the people of God, we are to declare that the Bible is God's inspired word. That simply means it is truthful and it is authoritative. Both the Old and New Testaments view the words of Scripture as God's own words. The Bible contains many examples of God's word spoken directly to his people. God's word spoken by his people and God's words written through his prophets and apostles. There is an authority that comes with scripture. We believe as disciples of Jesus Christ in that authority. This is another way of saying that the Bible is God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant word. It is the ultimate source of knowledge about God, as well as a definitive guide for our daily living. The Holy Scriptures comprised of the Old and New Testaments are fully and verbally inspired by God and are therefore infallible in the original writings and completely trustworthy in all areas in which they speak. Their central salvation message and essential teachings are clear and accessible to all who follow the standard and self-evident rules of literary criticism. Literary criticism is defined as the study, evaluation, and interpretation of literature. Scripture is therefore supreme, unmediated, and the final authority of faith and practice for every believer. When you look at Psalm 119, it lets us know in verses 9 through 11, the word of God serves as a guide for godly living. In verse 28, God's word provides strength for the weary. In verse 33, God's word gives instruction. In verse 34, God's word gives understanding. In verse 40, God's word brings renewal to life. Verses 35 and verses 111, God's word leads to joy and delight. I want us to understand when God reveals himself, he does so at least in part by revealing to us information about himself. It is only by his revelation and illumination that we know God. God has preserved his revelation by the Holy Spirit's work of inspiration. By inspiration, we mean that God's Spirit exerted a superintending influence on the writers of Scripture so that God's revelation has been recorded as he intended. Thus, the writings of the prophets and apostles carry the same authority and effect as if God himself were speaking to us directly. The primary claim of the Bible to its own inspiration is found yet again in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable 
for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. We must grasp the fact that the Bible has purpose and it was given to us for a reason. We have to understand the Bible has meaning. The books that make up the Bible have meaning and the passages that make up the books that make up the Bible have meaning. God gave us the word so we could have understanding. He did not give us his word to confuse us. So we have to begin to look at meaning. What do we mean by meaning? Two people will look at the same scripture and come up with different interpretations of that scripture. These different interpretations can even be opposing. Can they both be correct? The answer is no. None of the laws of logic apply to scripture. It is unfortunate that in the church on today, people have decided that the laws of logic don't apply to scripture. It doesn't really matter what the meaning of the text actually is. For them, the meaning of the text is not in the text. It is in their response to the text. And everyone is free to have his or her own response. Meaning in that line of thinking becomes purely subjective. Meaning is not our subjective thoughts read into the text, but God's objective truth read out of the text. The task of Bible study is to think God's thoughts after him. He has a mind and he has revealed it in his word. The miracle is that he used human authors to do this, working through their personalities, their circumstances, and their concerns. The Holy Spirit superintended the crafting of a document. And each of the human authors, which are God's co-authors, had a specific message in mind as he recorded his portion of the biblical text, the construction of meaning. The quality of your interpretation will always depend on the quality of your observation. It is totally impossible to understand what the writer means until you notice what the writer says. To observe well is to interpret well. You must observe with a view to interpret. Observation is never an end to itself, but it is always a means to an end. See, the problem we have with the interpretation of scripture is not with the word of God, but it is with the misinterpretation of the text. How does interpretation relate to observation? It all begins with observation. If you have the textbook, go back to the section on observation and review that section. Refresh your memory on what it means to observe the biblical text. Think about the questions that you need to ask the biblical text as you observe it. I want you to understand on today that the quality of your interpretation will always depend on the quality of your observation. It is 100% impossible to understand what the writer means until you notice what the author says. So my brothers and my sisters on today, you must read to observe well is to interpret well. Why must we interpret scripture? 
Why can't we just open the word, read what we're supposed to do, and simply do it? Why do we have to go through so much trouble to understand the text? We have to ask ourselves, what is between us and understanding the biblical message? The simple fact is that there are barriers between us and the biblical message. First, there is the language barrier. Have you ever learned a foreign language? If so, you know that learning the words are not enough. You have to learn the mindset, the culture, the worldview of those who speak the language if you really want to understand what they are saying. Next, there is cultural barriers. These are closely related to the problems of the language because language is always cultural bound. The Bible is a product and the presentation of cultures that are dramatically different from our own. And also they can be different from each other. To appreciate what is going on in the Bible, we have to construct cultural context in areas of communication, transportation, trade, agriculture, occupations, religion, perception of time, and so on and so on. Literary barriers. Another problem we run into in interpreting scripture is the variety of the terrain. Think about it. If we were all mountains, deserts, or oceans, we could outfit ourselves appropriately and simply have at it. But the literary genres in the Bible are quite diverse, and they demand vastly different approaches. We can't read Song of Solomon the same way we read Romans. We can't read the parables the same way we read Galatians. Next, there are communication barriers. Understand, even though God himself is speaking through scripture, we still must contend with breakdowns in the communication process. As finite creatures, we could never know what is going on with someone else's mind completely. As a result, we have to settle for limited objectives in our interpretation of scripture. So can we interpret anything? Is it possible to interpret the Bible? Yes, it is. But you need to understand you will always encounter problems. You can never answer every question. So we must approach the Bible diligently. We must remember, as students of the Bible, we must handle the biblical text with care. Here are some hazards to avoid. The first one is misreading the text. You will never gain proper understanding of scripture if you don't or you can't read the text properly. If you want to study the Bible, you have to know how to read or you have to learn how to read. There is no other way. Ignorant of what the text says is the unpardonable sin of interpretation. The next one is distortion of the text. Distorting the text is when a person makes the text say what they want the text to say, not what it actually said. It's one thing to struggle with difficulties in the interpretation process. It is another thing to distort the meaning of God's word. That, my brothers and sisters, is a serious offense. That is something God will bring to judgment. So we need to be careful to learn how to interpret scripture accurately 
practically and profitably. Next, we must avoid contradicting the text. This error is even worse than textual distortion. It amounts to calling God a liar. The classic illustration is Satan in the Garden of Eden. The next one is subjectivism. Many Christians tolerate this form of mysticism in reading their Bibles that they would not allow in any other situation. They violate the rules of reason and common sense. Their Bible study is totally subjective. What they do, they wander around scripture, waiting for something to hit them and say, jackpot, that's it. There's nothing wrong with having an emotional reaction to the word of God. But understand, the meaning of the text is in the text, not in our subjective response to the text. There are many people that assume that our faith means taking a deep breath, shutting our eyes, and believing what we know deep down on the inside is absolutely incredible. In fact, Christianity has often been caricatured as the non-thinking man's religion. This is not true. Jesus said that the greatest command is to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and your mind. When you become a Christian, you do not throw your brain into neutral. My brothers and sisters, we must think. So understand, the Bible does not yield its fruit to those who are lazy. Next, we must avoid relativism. Some people approach scripture assuming that the Bible changes meaning over time. It absolutely does not. They say the text meant one thing when it was written and it means something else today. That means the Bible is relative. Understand. The passage could have numerous practical implications, but the passage can have only one proper interpretation. That means there's only one meaning to the text. Ultimately, that one meaning is the meaning that was intended by the original writer. We have to reconstruct the original writer's message as if we want an accurate understanding. Next, there's overconfidence. In Bible study, as in life, pride goes before the fall. The minute you think you've mastered a portion of scripture, you are setting yourself up for failure. Why? Because knowledge puffs up. It can make you arrogant and unteachable. Some of the worst abuse of doctrine occur when someone sets himself or herself up as the ultimate authority on the text. Some of us have been studying scripture all our lives. We've been in the church since we were children, but no human can ever master more than one book of the Bible. I'm going to say that one more time. No human, not you or me, can master more than one book of the Bible. Even if we have an entire lifetime of study, we won't be able to do it. So don't expect when you come to the Bible and spend a half an hour or 45 minutes studying, that you're going to walk away with the ultimate answer. That is not to say that you should not come to a conclusion about what the text means or that you cannot feel confident about what you believe. 
just keep in mind that the process of interpretation never ends. The last hazard is the right to disagree. In light of all these hazards we've talked about, is it really possible to come out with an accurate interpretation of the biblical text? Yes, it is. Even though a Bible passage ultimately has only one correct interpretation, you'll always find Christians who disagree about what that interpretation should be. This can be very frustrating, but it's inevitable, my brothers and sisters. Two people can watch the same bank robbery, but in court, they describe it in two complete different ways. Difference in interpretations are fine, as long as we keep in mind that the conflict is not in the text, but in a limited understanding of the text by us. God is not confused about what he has said, even if we are. As we conclude this session of Digiversity, I really want us to grasp the fact that we have to be diligent in the observation portion of our study. And remember that in the observation portion, we have to be diligent about our reading. And remember that observation fuels interpretation. And interpretation will in turn fuel our application. And remember that there are barriers that we will have to overcome. The language barrier, cultural barrier, the literary barrier, and the communication barrier. So handle the Bible with care. Remember, God has made himself known to us through his word. It is a gift from our Lord and our Savior. So let's begin to treat God's word like it truly is a gift from him. Let us begin to treasure the word. Let us begin to read the word, digest the word, live the word, teach the word, so that other folks may come running asking, what must I do to be saved? But we must handle the word of God with care. And we have to be aware of the hazards that we face when coming to the text. We can't misread the text. We cannot distort the text, nor can we contradict the text. And we have to be aware of subjectivism, relativism, overconfidence, and the right to disagree. But lastly, before we are done, I want to let you know that we have to be aware of the different genres in the Bible. Before launching into Bible study, we must be aware of what genre of literature that we are reading. And we must ask ourselves, what kind of literature was the author writing? What literary form did he employ? And so we must be aware of the different types of literature in the Bible. There's exposition. There's narrative. There's biography. There are parables. There's poetry. There are proverbs. There's prophecy and apocalyptic. So be aware of what you are reading. And it is my prayer that you get the most out of your Bible study. I thank you for being a part of this experience. God bless you. And if you need me, feel free to reach out to me at my personal email, pastorhmbc at gmail.com. God bless you.